Coming up, the changing face of Indian country and how blood quantum is being discussed more and more. Plus, younger generations of Alaska Natives are dealing with identity issues as the 50th anniversary of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act approaches. I'm Patty Thawahunga. Join us for those interviews, plus headlines from Indian Country Today. The Walter Cronkite School of Journalism and Mass Communication at Arizona State University is honored to be a supporter of Indian Country Today. Working with award-winning professors, Cronkite students learn news reporting, social media, shooting and editing videos, and producing content for communications industries. Cronkite's 15 professional programs give students the opportunity to cover critical issues throughout the U.S. and beyond. Learn more at cronkite.asu.edu. is Indian Country Today. Esquili, yes, eh, thank you for joining us. I'm Patty Thawahungva. The 2020 census numbers are out and the native population is up by 86%. The new figures offer a detailed portrait of how the country is more racially diverse since 2010. American Indian and Alaska Natives now represent almost 3% of the U.S. population. The state with the largest population of Native Americans is Alaska, followed by New Mexico. Overall, the indigenous population in the U.S. increased from 5.2 million people in 2010 to 9.7 million in 2020. Native Hawaiians and people with mixed Hawaiian heritage count for 1.6 million of the population. Native Americans were not counted in the census until 1860, but have been counted ever since. The demographic data will be used to re redraw the nation's political districts. Indian Health Service staff are now required to receive vaccinations against the coronavirus. Limited exemptions will be given to those who have a valid medical or religious exemption on file. All IHS employees have until October 1st to get fully vaccinated. This new directive is aimed at protecting the health and safety of the workforce and patients. And tribes are doing their part to make sure the citizens are protected. The White Mountain Apache Tribe in Arizona is even offering stipends to its citizens who live off the reservation if they can prove they have been vaccinated. The Indian Health Service is under the Department of Health and Human Services. In a press release, IHS says it has enough data to know vaccines are safe and effective in protecting against severe disease and hospitalization. HHS is the latest department within the Biden administration to implement vaccine requirements for staff. 2020 was supposed to be the year of the Shawnee language declared by the tribe, but then COVID-19 hit and almost derailed the plans. According to Cronkite News, the program was moved online with virtual classes. This allowed the tribe to actually increase class size and provide more learning opportunities. Citizens can now practice pronouncing Shawnee words and increase their vocabulary, and they can log in from anywhere in the world to take classes. So far, Shawnee people living in California and Virginia and other places have attended the virtual classes. According to UNESCO, about 100 people still speak the Shawnee language. Tribal Chief Ben Barnes declared a state of emergency for the language in January, warning the voices of the grandparents could be lost forever. He went on to say they can't wait and to act until there is a better time under more favorable conditions. Two Shawnee elders died of COVID and a third died of natural causes in the last year. The pandemic has prompted a sense of urgency to teach the younger generation the language and the culture. Sea Alaska Heritage Institute held a homecoming ceremony to welcome back a collection of sacred objects. Some of the items include a clinket mask and a hat with ties to Alaska Native claims. Other sacred artifacts that are also being repatriated include rattles, an octopus bag, painted spruce root hats, robes, and blankets. The collection was donated to the Institute by the Wells Fargo Bank, which had, the, had held the items in a museum in Anchorage. Rosita Worrell is the president of the Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. At the ceremony, she talked about the strength of Alaska Natives. This is the strength of our people that you've seen. You saw our young ones. Oh, I'm so proud of my nephews. I'm so proud of my grandchildren. 
to show the world that our culture will still continue, that the voices of our ancestors will still be heard on this land. The hat and the mask made by Clinkett master artist Michael Beasley will be available at the Institute for Study by students. North Dakota's University of Mary is receiving nearly $3 million to help Native American students interested in the field of education. The two fully funded grants are being awarded from the Office of Indian Education's Professional Development Program. The first grant goes towards scholarships for students earning a degree in teacher education or special education. The second grant funds graduate students who enter the university's online Master's of Education program. The grants will cover five years starting this fall semester. This is the first time the university has received the full amount possible from the federal government. And in Bolivia, the government held a ceremony for a mummified Inca girl who has finally been returned to her home. The girl was removed from her homelands in, the, in 1980 by a U.S. diplomat's family. Her remains were then donated to a museum at Michigan State University. A week ago, she was returned home to Bolivia, where she was met by dignitaries and given the name Safi. Her new name is an Aymara word for roots. She is believed to have lived among the Pacajes band of Aymara people between 1100 and 1450 AD. It's it's our Inca grandmother, our sister, that has returned from where she should have never left. Her remains are now at the Bolivian National Museum of Archaeology. And those are the headlines from Indian Country Today. I'm Patty Thalahungva. When we come back, the question of blood quantum and how it's affecting the future of tribal enrollment. And later, another issue of identity for Alaska Natives. Do they identify with a tribe, a village, or a corporation? Like any nation, tribal nations decide who can be a citizen. Sounds straightforward. However, for tribal leaders, the decision weighs heavy because so many tribes have a blood quantum requirement. What happens when the bloodline is diluted? The Boys Fort Band of Chippewa in Minnesota is dealing with that issue right now, along with other five Anishinaabe bands that include White Earth, Mille Lacs, Grand Portage, and Fond du Lac from the Minnesota Chippewa tribe. And just to be clear, the people call themselves Anishinaabe. It was the French who gave them the name Chippewa. Joining us today is Kathy Shavers, the tribal chairman of the Boys Fort Band of Chippewa and the current president of the Minnesota Chippewa Tribe. Welcome, President Shavers. Thank you. Who's you, Anin? So let's start with the big picture. Um, trying to come up with a strategy for citizenship is very different now in the 21st century than it would have been for any other generation, yet it's very complicated. <laughs> it is very complicated. And uh, uh, within the Minnesota Chippewa tribe here, we have uh, 40,000 plus members. So trying to get a, a consensus uh, from 40,000 individuals on what direction we wanna go with uh, tribal enrollment and the blood quantum issue is, is a huge undertaking. How do you go about finding that consensus? Well, right now uh, with the Minnesota Chippewa tribe, we are trying to do uh, um, a referendum for all the tribal members because enrollment uh, blood quantum is a huge issue uh, for us because there was a wilder study done a few years back that shows that uh, different scenarios of uh, if we went down to one eighth blood quantum versus one quarter blood quantum, which is the blood requirement right now. And if we did nothing at all, um, if we did nothing at all, it shows that eventually we will no longer exist. Um, and so there is something that needs to be done, but what exactly is that. And then the other thing is regarding the um, Canadian blood, because uh, as Chippewa or Ojibwe or Anishinaabe, uh, we have traveled, um, a lot of our ancestors are from Canada, and we traveled on the, the great, uh, great lakes in the, in the um, 
other various bodies of water to try to get here to Net Lake where, where I am and other areas where there was rice, deer, moose, you know, things to eat. And so over the centuries, we traveled those waterways and we landed here. So a lot of our ancestors are in Canada. Now, Canadians don't have blood quantum. So, you know, another part of the Wilder study was to try and include that other blood, plus other uh, tribal blood, such as uh, there's uh, Ojibwe bands out in Michigan. So there's all kinds of different ways and different um, perspectives on how to deal with that. But it's very difficult because everybody has the, in their own mind what, what they feel it should be. So right now the Minnesota Chippewa tribe has uh, uh, decided to say, hey, you know, we know we're going undergoing constitution reform right now. And a big part of the constitution is enrollment and blood quantum. And so what does our band membership or our um, MCT tribal membership want? Do they want the, uh, for example, there's, there's various uh, ways we can go. So the first question we thought would be is to ask our membership, the 40,000 plus MCT members, uh, do you want each band, because we're each still um, tribal nations, uh, uh, sovereign nations, and that uh, we also um, can determine our own blood quantum or should be able to do that. So that's the first question we're asking our tribal um, members through the MCT is, uh, should the bands decide their own uh, enrollment and blood quantum issue? Um, because we are still sovereign nations, uh, although we're under the umbrella of the organizational structure of the Minnesota Chippewa tribe, we are still sovereign nations. So uh, in an example, the White Earth Band has 40, uh, 20,000 plus members where the Boys Fort Band has 3,500 members. Do we want a majority of other tribes making a determination for our tribal members? That's the question. And that's where it gets a little sticky. We had a piece last week from Alaska. And what's really extraordinary is because of the whole um, ANCSA and the shareholders, you have people that are neither shareholders nor enrolled members, but still consider themselves Alaska Native. And that really that quandary is what trying to resolve is very difficult. Right. And what we run into here too, is that everybody, an example is in the Minnesota Chippewa tribe, if you were less than a quarter by 1960, a certain date in 1960, um, you were eligible for enrollment. But any time after that date, uh, you are not eligible for enrollment. So we have brothers and sisters who maybe three of them are enrolled, but that other brother was born after that date and he's not enrolled, but they're all part of the same family. The other part we run into is the fractionated interest can go up from uh, 568 over 1,129. I mean, I don't know how they come up with some of the fractionated interest uh, uh, for the blood clums, but it, it's 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 kind of outrageous because, um, and we don't really believe in the blood quantum issue here at Boys Ford ourselves because, the and I think it's kind of, nationwide, if I might say, um, is that the only people that actually have um, blood quantums are, uh, are determined are, are dogs, horses, and natives. So it's, it's, it's something that was imposed upon us that uh, we feel was um, uh, set to ex eliminate us in the future. And uh, we don't agree with it, but now we have to try fix it. Well, in fact, in Minnesota, there's a really brutal history. I, I've read the Smithsonian sending out folks at the turn of the last century to take people's hair samples and from that determine whether they were mixed blood or not and then take their land. Yes, and, and that's, I actually had a uh, piece of paper from the um, University of Minnesota Animal Biology Lab that was testing a piece of hair to let, to, to see if the thickness of the hair to see if they were native or not. Um, and that that's a disgrace in my estimations and you know, we were given, uh, um, we were given English names. We were, you know, by the way we looked and how we were, you know, the color of our skin. And like right now, I don't look like I'm an enrolled native. Um, you know, I took on my father's traits. I didn't take my mother's traits on, but I'm an enrolled boys sport band member. I am over one quarter Native American. Um, a lot of people feel that we shouldn't have that and everybody's native. Uh, if you even have one 1,000, but then there's others that feel that, um, you know, 
you still need to have that blood quantum. We don't have many full bloods left and we don't have many first speakers left. So we need to do something to um, keep our, our bands and our people alive. There are two interesting um, proposals that I've heard that I'm curious about. One is kinship and making sure that people are connected by families of one way or another. And, and the other is what if there were some sort of citizenship test? And I know Ethel Branch, who was the Attorney General at Navajo Nation said, if people had to prove uh, cultural competency, how would that look? And would it be uh, a long range strategy for tribal renewal? It could be a long range strategy for tribal renewal. However, um, we just went through an all staff training here last week on the boarding school era. And uh, if you went by cultural competency now, um, a lot of native people don't know a lot about native people because of the boarding school and historical trauma that we faced from that boarding school with them, um, um, you know, our language being taken and our, our culture being taken away from us and basically beaten out of us and, and tortured out of us. And that historical trauma weighs heavy with us today. Um, there's even myself as an example, I, I lived 19 miles from the reservation my whole life and did not know my grandmother was fluent or part of the boarding school. Um, she never spoke the language, she never taught the culture, she never did anything. Um, and to this day, I, I regret not tapping into that knowledge, but was unaware of it because of the historical trauma that my grandmother faced uh, when she was at the boarding school. What about the kinship angle? The kinship angle is, uh, you know, within our culture here for the um, Ojibwe and Anishinaabe, um, Family's everything and the kinship model would be very good um, because right now we have multiple families living together, whether there are cousins or whether there are um, nephews, nieces, their family. So the family model, uh, the kinship model would be ideal. Um, I think for, and it depends on each tribe, each tribe is different. Um, we're all unique. We're, no one is the same. So whatever models work for one tribe might, might not work for another, mo uh, another tribe. You mentioned uh, the difference between White Earth and Boys Fort. And in global nations, nations want to be bigger. They want to have the most citizens possible because it gives them more clout. But that's not always true in Indian country. There's a, a, a thing about holding on to people and being the smaller the number. Yeah, you know, right now the federal government isn't uh, meeting its full trust responsibility to tribes. And if we increase our numbers, we know that our funding won't be increased. Um, you know, a lot of tribes, smaller tribes like Boys Fort rely heavily on um, the federal government for programs and services. And right now our tribe and in the Bemidji area here for Minnesota, our tribe is um, basically only funded at 40% of the need or most tribes are only funded at 40% of the need. So um, we know that if there's bigger numbers, it might mean less services for some of our people and less funding, unless the federal government steps up and meets that trust responsibility. This is terrible to ask with a minute left, but uh, how does gaming and the pandemic play into enrollment questions? Uh, gaming does play into uh, enrollment with the fact that there are some tribes that give out per capita from their gaming. And if their enrollment is increased, and it may decrease that per capita amount for that individual, but a lot of tribes aren't able to do that. So um, it doesn't affect us in that manner. Um, so that, that would be how it would be affected. President Shavers, thank you so much. Oh, thank you so much for having me today. Really appreciate it. When we come back, how are Alaska Natives dealing with the issue of identity? We'll hear from our special correspondent, Megan Sullivan. The Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act turns 50 this year. When it was created, it was set up a system that seems very different from what tribes in the lower 48 have. Depending on when you were born, some Alaska Natives are shareholders in village or regional corporations. And one unintended consequence of the issue of identity, what does it mean to be a shareholder? Megan Sullivan joins us now to tell us more about this, this system and why younger generations are questioning the process. Welcome, Megan. Hi, thanks for having me. 
So you've been taking a look at a number of issues, but the last series was on identity. And there's a difference between young people and old, older people and how they view this. Yes, exactly. Um, so younger people who were born after 1971 are unable to become shareholders in an Alaska Native corporation unless they inherit shares or are gifted shares. Um, and a number of the corporations now have worked around this problem and are are looking to open up enrollment to descendants. Um, but because of this, you know, a lot of people, young people, have questions about the process um, and are, you know, starting to mobilize around the topic. Well, and when uh, ANGSA was passed, it actually ended some of the reservations, almost all except for one in Alaska, and said these tribal governments won't exist. But then during um, the Clinton administration, tribes started getting recognized again, primarily as villages. What is that tension? Yeah, so there's a couple different um, kind of options for a young Alaska Native. Um, they could be a tribal member and a shareholder in their corporation, um, or they could only be enrolled in one. And so you see that tension there where there's a little bit of a division where people are either a tribal citizen or a shareholder. Um, some people want to be both, some people want to join their tribe, some people want to be a shareholder, but sometimes they're unable to because of rules like not being able to open up to descendants. And so you see that tension there um, and you see kind of people looking for that belonging and, um, you know, emotions run high when people aren't able to enroll as a shareholder or as a tribal citizen. So that's kind of what our series was looking at, the division between the generations and sometimes even between tribes and corporations. And in some ways, it seems like um, a profound question when it really determines the future of what it means to be Alaska Native 50 years from now, 100 years from now. Yeah, I mean, as time goes on, more people are concerned about this issue because more and more Alaska Natives aren't being shareholders, aren't able to be shareholders right now. Um, and if there's no shareholders for the Alaska Native corporations, you know, it begs the question, what happens to the corporations? What happens to the traditional lands the corporations oversee? So our latest identity story was kind of looking at potential solutions around um, the, the issue of enrollment in corporations. And maybe talk about some of those solutions and what might happen. Yeah, so we talked to scholars, lawyers, um, other tribes who've gone through the process themselves, and there's lots of different ways um, you could kind of make this process different. Um, one is a system of lineal descent instead of based on blood quantum, um, and this is kind of supposed to mimic the traditional kinship ties you would see, um, you know, before blood quantum. Um, other solutions are just lowering the blood quantum amount needed to enroll. Um, one tribe in particular had this interesting solution, which they called the Four Fourths Band Aid, where anyone who was an enrolled member would officially be considered to have full blood quantum amount, um, which means that their descendants would have also more blood quantum and just kind of that kind of paused the topic for a bit. Um, until they could find a more long-term solution, but that ensured that future generations would be able to enroll a bit longer. Um, some other processes, there's kind of, um, you know, I think some tribes have been a little bit, um, they've questioned if they should open up to lineal descent because that begs the question, you know, who's gonna be enrolled? Are they actually, you know, members of the community that, that care about the community? And so um, some have opened up a process that's si similar to citizenship naturalization that you would see in the US or other countries where you have to go through a more intense process. You have to maybe take a test, you have to show your dedication. Um, so those are some of the options. Um, it was really interesting to hear kind of all the creative solutions going on around the country mm -hmm. and how Alaskan communities can kind of learn from that themselves. One thing that seems unique to both Alaska and Indian country in general is the idea that geography has a different place in our mind. We may live in a city, but we may think we live in a village. Yeah, and a lot of people have that tie to their homelands, no matter where they live. And that's a topic that came up a lot. Um, and, it, you know, as people are more mobile and are moving away and 
but they want to have that strong connection to their community still, that's also something that um, these processes were trying to take into account, how to include all members, no matter where they live. Um, and the corporations, that's something they focus on too. One of the corporations, when I was interviewing them, really focused on that, how their shareholders, um, they have shareholders in the villages, they have shareholders in urban places in Alaska, and they have shareholders now all over the world. And so they're looking to kind of include those people um, and keep that community sense strong no matter where people are living. Megan, this series runs through December, which is the actual 50th anniversary. What's coming up next? So up next, we're looking at the relationship between ANCSA and subsistence rights. Um, and beyond that, also looking at the relationship between ANCSA and natural resource development and kind of how all those topics interact. And, um, you know, I'm really excited about the subsistence story. There's a lot going on right now legally in terms of that. And, you know, people have a lot to say. So I, I think it's going to be an important story to focus on. Well, subsistence becomes even more important in an era of climate change because things that people took for granted may not be the case. Definitely. You're already seeing a lot of changes over the last 10 years. So. Megan Sullivan, thank you so much. Thank you. And that's a slice of our indigenous world. Thank you for watching. For all the latest news, go to IndianCountryToday.com. I'm Mark Trahant. Sometimes you got to take a stand Just because you know you can oh, You got to run, you got to run This is Indian Country Today.